Welcome to the Nourishment Mindset Podcast, your guide to good food, good health, and a good life. And now, here's your host, Nutrition Network Advisor and author of The Nourishment Mindset, Dixie Huey. Happy Transformation Tuesday, y'all. Welcome to or back to the Nourishment Mindset Podcast, where we are on a metabolic mission to help you achieve vitality and reverse chronic lifestyle conditions. How do we do this? We use my three principles, real whole foods, straight talk, and the pleasures of the table. If you haven't yet taken a moment, less than one minute out of your time, if you're enjoying this content, Please take 30 seconds to hop onto the podcast platform on which you're listening and give me a review. And if you have read the book, please take 30 more tiny little seconds to give me a review on Amazon. I super appreciate it. I also love it when you send me show ideas or questions. So keep them coming, y'all. Today's topic features a very special guest. He is a physical therapist, and for better or worse, I have spent many a time on the PT table. This gentleman specializes in holistic approaches to managing pain. So, of course, this meshes perfectly with the nourishment mindset. So we're going to dive in. Today's guest is Rick Olderman, and he is one of my favorite kind of people. He is a a physical therapist, an author, and the founder of the Fixing You Method. Welcome, Rick. Thanks for having me, Dixie. Appreciate you being here. I value very much what you all do. I have been literally joint saved by people in your profession. Um, I do want to take a second to give a shout out to John Majerus of Majerus and Company in Vancouver, Washington, and Dr. Mike White here in Naples. Both of them are joint saviors to me. Um, I would love to know how you found this calling um, to, to be a physical therapist. Yeah, well, I kind of stumbled into it myself. Uh, you know, I grew up on a farm in Ohio, so we had never even heard of physical therapy. And all through college, I had never heard of physical therapy. You know, it, you just kind of fix it yourself kind of thing, you know. And uh, later in my 20s, uh, a friend of mine mentioned that her dad was in physical therapy. And I'm just like, well, what's that? So I was having back pain at the time anyway. So I thought I'd check it out. And uh, just fell in love with it. It seemed really cool to me, a, a nice blend of medicine and exercise and, you know, movement-based kind of stuff. And when I went and volunteered, it seemed so mysterious to me, you know, where do these people, how do they know what's going on below that skin, you know? And uh, so that's why I got into it. I'm just curious, what has been most surprising about this career for you? Yeah, well, the surprising thing to me was I thought I was going to be taught everything. I thought everything that needed to be known about pain was already discovered mm -hmm. and that I was going to be shown exactly what to do about back pain, neck pain, headaches, all that kind of stuff. And that did not happen. In fact, <laughs> I was in a near panic when I was about to graduate because I thought I must have missed a course on you know, pain. And because uh, most of the courses are about okay, you've got a bicep strain. Here's what you do. You know, here's some things you can try with back pain, but there was nothing that talked about, well, why are they having back pain in the first place? And to me, that seemed to be central to understanding what to do for pain. And so uh, that bore out when, uh, during my first uh, job, I was in a rural clinic and I was a failure. I mean, anyone who came in with any kind of chronic or difficult pain issue, I didn't know what to do. I, I did really well with acute issues and school had trained me really well for acute issues. But for chronic issues, I was what those rules did not apply to chronic pain. And so I was sunk into a deep depression for a few years until I moved here to Denver and went to work at a busy uh, uh, elite health spa downtown. And my schedule was instantly filled with people with chronic and nagging pain. And I'm just like, what? 
all of them had been to doctors, chiropractors, physical therapy, you name it. They had great insurance, but they still had pain. And that's when I started realizing that, oh my gosh, it's not just me who's a failure. A lot of health and medical pr practitioners are failing at chronic pain. And that's when I decided I, I, I had to try and figure this out. I love it. And you, you know, it's, it's that root cause search when I'm, I'm looking at metabolic health, you know, what's the root cause, you know, it's, it's not that you didn't get a correct, usually, especially with metabolic health, but it's not that you're not taking enough of metformin, you know, there's something that comes well before that. And of course it's nutrition and lifestyle, but I, I love that. And I, I'm really looking forward to getting into the nitty gritty with you on that. So um, you have said pain is a signal that something's wrong. So let's talk about that. Explain that to us, please. Yeah. So our natural state is not to be in pain. Our natural state, you know, if, if we cut our skin, it heals in a few days. If we, you know, tear a muscle, that'll heal in a few weeks. And if we break a bone, that heals in six to eight weeks. So our bodies have these internal mechanisms to fix problems. And so if we're having a chronic pain issue, it means that something is, has become a barrier to solving that pain. Well, if you look at online and, and most practitioners, you know, if you see uh, something is painful and you know, they apply a treatment of, of some sort, maybe you do an exercise that you learned online or something like that, and it doesn't help your pain, then there's no mechanism. We're not taught how to learn from that failure. Hmm. And so your body is trying to show you where the problem is. It's showing you that you're having pain and that something is wrong because our natural state is not to be in pain. The problem is, Dixie, is that we have not been given the vocabulary to understand what the body is trying to tell us. Hmm. One of the reasons is because especially how we're trained as physical therapists is what I call component thinking. And what that means is we've got a million tests, scans, x-rays, orthopedic tests to identify a tissue that's damaged, but we have zero tests that identify why that tissue is damaged. And identifying a damaged tissue from, a, from an acute issue, which means pain less than three months or a recent injury, you know, that's, you know, pretty easy to do. Oh yeah. You, you tore your rotator cuff, you need surgery or, you know, let's let it heal and it'll blah, blah, blah. But, uh, there's no, for chronic pain, you need, you have to rely heavily on why that tissue is damaged. And there, we're not trained to think that way in, in PT school. So Long-winded answer to a short question. But, but so <laughs> essentially what I'm hearing is we need a new framework. We need a new way of thinking and we need use, a new vocabulary to describe this. I, I believe so. Um, the vocabulary, like I said, what, that we have works well for acute systems, right. but not chronic pain issues. As, as evidenced by the fact that chronic pain is so prevalent in the world. Yeah. Yes, inflammation. I mean, look at all of our brilliant med medical minds, right? All of these really, really smart people, but we still have chronic pain. Right. It doesn't make sense. And it's because we're not asking the right questions. Ooh, good. I love it. So pain is indeed a hot topic. It can be absolutely debilitating. I have been there. I see a lot of pain within the population of the metabolically unhealthy, which the listeners know is most of America, but you know, the more metabolically unhealthy or the less healthy you are, I see more pain. Um, and, and so to me, it's this question of inflammation. Like, is that part of your framework and, and root cause? I mean, I have no answer other than, you know, working on the diet and the lifestyle, but from, from where you sit, from a chronic pain framework perspective, what do you do with this concept of inflammation? Is that helpful or is that also the wrong question? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I've been doing this for over 25 years, so I've, I've wondered about that very question myself. So, because I run into that. So I, I've developed an overall theory of pain 
I call it the three pillars of pain. Okay. So up, at a certain level, we all experience pain, you know, and whether your level is up here or down there, it doesn't really matter. If you go above that level, you have pain. And I believe that there are three primary things that are pushing us above that level of pain, that, that critical threshold. One is, of course, musculoskeletal problems, and that's what I focus on. Another is social, emotional, mm. uh, psychological issues. That also generates tension that occurs in certain patterns in the body that causes pain. And, that, and then the third is dietary, allergen, mold types of issues. Those also can cause inflammatory states that also can occur in patterns in the body. So some of us have, you know, 90% dietary, you know, issues, and some of us have 90% emotional issues, and some of us have 90% musculoskeletal, and it can be a blend of all three. And, and so this is why when you go to a self-help section in your bookstore, you'll see basic grouping of dietary issues, psychological issues. And then musculoskeletal issues. And this is, if you, if you look closely at all those titles, those are the three components that are breaking down pain into these three basic aspects. Oh, that is beautiful, high level thinking. I love that. And cheers to you for bringing the psychological element into this space, because as usual, that's the one that's sort of the redheaded stepchild in the, you know, medical traditional medical <laughs> milieu. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, if our talk goes there, I can, I can tell you what I believe is the pathway that causes that as well, that I, from my basic understanding of how things work in the body. So well, let's just go there. You've already turned off the highway. Let's just sail out <laughs> on a detour and then we can get back on. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't want to try, I don't want to geek out too much. Uh, but I'll, I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. So within our body, we have fascia, all right? And fascia is connective tissue that connects everything to everything. And we have these super highways of fascia that run from our head to our feet. And these super highways can be dissected. You can, in fact, uh, Thomas Myers is the one who identified all of these. He's a big fascia researcher. And you can, I, you can take a piece of, you know, dissect a, a piece of fascia from the very top of your head and it will be one contiguous tissue all the way down to the bottom of your foot. And, you, and that is a certain highway of fascia there's, that runs along the back. Well, there's two other highways along the front. There's another highway along the side. And there's a spiraling highway that runs through the body as well. So not all fascia is built the same. And there's a certain type of fascia called myofibroblasts. Myo means muscle. And so myofibroblasts have up to four times the contractile capacity of regular fascia. Hmm. Myofibroblasts are laid down in areas of mechanical stress in your body. For instance, if we look at the spine, and for those of you listening, I'm pulling out my skeleton. Uh, if we look at the curve of the low back, we'll see that it is an inward curve, but then it becomes an outward curve at the pelvis. It also becomes an outward curve at the thoracic spine. So wherever curves change direction is an automatic mechanical stress point, right? And lo and behold, we have uh, an increased number of myofibroblasts at these stress points in our low back, in our neck, and other areas of our body that are undergoing excessive mechanical strain, all right? Now, so, and knowing that the myofibroblasts have up to four times contractile capacity, they become a pretty important element in terms of generating tension and pain in the body. So the interesting thing about myofibroblasts is that they do not respond to neurological input. They respond to chemical input. And the chemical input is a cytokine. And the mm -hmm. cytokine is called transforming growth factor beta one. Well, when we are, when our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight nervous system gets activated, it causes our immune system to start releasing more transforming growth factor beta one which then circulates in our bloodstream and hones in on the myofibroblast areas, causing those areas that are laid down because you already have mechanical stress to start then contracting even more. So that's the connection between psychological issues and pain. Psychological issues create stress. Stress then triggers this release and, the, and these cytokines then travel to areas of the body that are under mechanical strain already. I love it. Way to actually give the 
well, I'm sure you dumbed it down a little, but I felt like I was in a science class or physiology or PT type class. And then you summarized it in a way that's like, it's a sound bite to take away and, and think of. I love it. I, I'm in the middle of an article about fascia, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I've got to go run. I will see if I cannot find it and link it. But I believe it's talking about the gentleman that you mentioned who mapped yeah. all of this out. And I remember starting it last night and going, okay, I'm going to leave this for tomorrow because I'm starting to fall asleep right now. And I really yeah. want to read this. So um, there's a sign that I need to get back to it. Thank you. And y'all, I'll link this in the show notes if it's something I can find online. It's an actual piece, you know, a, a journal that I'm reading. So thank you for that explanation, Rick. Oh, sure. Thomas Myers is the boss of fascia research. Okay. And Dr. Robert Schleep is another, he's Dutch, I believe, he's a very okay. important researcher in fascia, if those, are, if your folks want to drill down more. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. So I'm one of these that, you know, I sort of joke sometimes, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So if you're going to go out there and be an athlete or be very active, you're going to run into maybe acute injuries. Sometimes those could turn chronic. You've just given a beautiful explanation of how it's a much broader framework than, than most of um, medical field imagines. One of the things for me that I just, it's a personal choice. I really, um, I don't like swallowing medication. Like the price of that is just too high. I'm into the gut biome and a lot of things that people find to be woo woo, but I just, to me that, you know, if, if my knee is hurting, I could easily take in a leave and, and maybe that would make it go away. But then, you know, per your point, I still have the root cause there. I basically put a bandaid over it. And then what's the price of, you know, taking this leave. And then especially if I'm, you know, swallowing them every day. So one of the things I read about you um, is that your, your fixing you method tends to be a more holistic approach and that, you know, I'm not surprised that a physical therapist wouldn't be, you know, promoting lots of medication, but how, how do you in the fixing you method make that more of a holistic approach with the goal of being not only pain-free or pain decreased, but maybe med-free or decreased? Yeah, so uh, it, it's a, a basic truth that I went into PT school with was that my back, I'm doing something that was causing my back pain. I am the source of my pain. Mm. And PT school did not address that, right? So I believe that we're all, to some degree, the sources of our own pain. And where you fall in those, that three pillar theory, that's really up to you and your history, right? right? But this gets into the, the whole approach that I've developed over this, over these 20 years or so, is that when I failed initially as a physical therapist, I, I had this one idea that, okay, something I'm doing was causing my pain and something these people are doing is causing their pain. And so I only knew of one physical therapist researcher who was looking into that. And that was Dr. Shirley Saruman out of University of Washington in St. Louis. She's written two textbooks. She's been teaching there for decades. She's generated hundreds of journal articles all published. And so I took all of her courses mm -hmm. and she connected movement with biomechanics and pain. And so that kind of opened my mind and suddenly all of my patients started getting better, right? But the way it works in medicine is that when you start getting a level of patients better, the next level starts knocking on your door. And so that next level started knocking on my door. And I realized that I needed to look for something more than just biomechanics. I need, and this is where I discovered Thomas Meyer's anatomy trains book, identifying fascia. And, and so folks, if, if we have fascia, that is running from the top of our head to the bottom of our foot and all of these different pathways through the body, then that means that anything I can touch along one part of that pathway is going to affect anything along another part of that pathway, right? And case in point, I had a woman come in who had chronic plantar fasciitis. We, I treated her and she called me three days later to say that her chronic headaches were gone too. And that was because that we influenced her fascia superhighway connecting the foot. I didn't touch her head or anything. 
I just dealt with her foot, feet and legs. And so we fixed that fascial superhighway as it related to her, her headache. So that when I, when I saw, when I discovered these fascial superhighways, then it allowed me to start looking further away from where the pain was occurring. Because then I intuitively understood, well, it could be anywhere along this whole path. And that's when I started finding more answers. But then the next tier of patients came in and these people seemed to have a battery that was charging their bodies into these painful patterns of movement that they were having. And I'm just like, what is going on here? And that's when I discovered Thomas Hanna's work with neurological patterns, uh, reflexive patterns that were causing pain in the body too. So here's the interesting thing. Dr. Shirley Saruman in physical therapy research, Thomas Myers in fascial research, and Dr. Thomas Hanna in psychological, neurologically based research, all came up with the same three patterns that cause almost all pain in the body. And when I got Thomas Hanna's three patterns and I saw the link between the other two, that's when my head exploded. And that's <laughs> when I knew I had it, right? So uh, what they didn't really go into as much was why are these three patterns occurring in us? I felt intuitively still that something that we're doing is causing this pattern to exist and be played out in our bodies. And that's what my next 15 years of physical therapy was really focusing on is trying to understand why the patterns. So that's what the, my fixing your method is about. And when you ask about hol holistic approach, this is really what it's about is an understanding of this interplay between our habits, our psychology, and how that influences our musculoskeletal system. Wow. That's wonderful. Whole different way of thinking about it. And so now I just, I have to ask when, when, it, when a new patient comes to you, you know, let's say it's me because I'm here with you. Um, I tweaked my knee a couple weeks ago. All of a sudden I'm doing my, you know, stair mill hit interval thing. And my knee just doesn't like it. So I know better than to keep going in the moment. I'm not super stupid. <laughs> I still have to teach yoga that day, but I modify it. See, you know, it going, it's coming. So if I walked in complaining, okay, um, Rick, I've got, my knee hurts in the front of the kneecap. What are some of the things that you do? How do you work with me to identify because you've got this whole body framework? What happens? It's quite simple, to be honest. So uh, I've broken the body down into two systems of movement. One is anyone who comes into my clinic with back or any kind of lower body pain, that's one system of movement. So we evaluate that. If you come in with shoulder, neck, headaches, that's a second system of movement from the pelvis on up to the head. So we evaluate that too. So over the years, what I've done is I've, uh, I've, I've learned what the major players are in these systems and what are the common things that are going wrong. And most of them, and we can go drill down into it if you want to, but most of them are things that most other practitioners are overlooking. And so one of the very first things I would look at you, I would watch you walk to my table because any lower body system and back issue has its roots in some kind of problem with your gait pattern. Yeah. So ultimately, whether it's the first thing or the last thing, we're gonna be fixing how you're walking. And I would guess, Dixie, you're probably locking your knees at some point. And that is one of the things that's maybe contributing to your, to your chronic knee issue. Bingo. So, yeah. <laughs> Hyper extended is what they called it when I was a dancer. Yes. Yes. Oh, so you were a dancer. Okay. So that's a nightmare. Now, now I understand a, a larger pattern of your problems. <laughs> right. Do you, do you think people maybe aren't meant to hop around on their toes? Is that part of the problem? Uh, not for hours at a time. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. The gait exercise is always, um, um, Interesting. And so are you, you're looking at the gate. What else are you doing? You, you're probably talking yeah. about lifestyle or. Well, yeah, because gate is a function of lifestyle to some extent. Right. But, but one of the things that I'm looking at is, for instance, have you ever heard of femoral antiversion or femoral retroversion? I know what femoral means and I know what 
introversion and retroversion mean, but I haven't heard them together. Yeah, so uh, not everyone's thigh bones are all shaped the same. And some thigh bones are twisted inward, which is called femoral antiversion. And some thigh bones are twisted outward, which is called femoral retroversion. So this has consequences for how the hip joint, the pelvis, the SI joint, so forth, the knee, the foot, how all of that works together. And so uh, if based on, you know, most females tend towards for more antiversion and most males tend towards for more retroversion. And this is, this is, is kind of seen in when you hear people complain about man spreading, when we sit down and our knees are wide apart, right? <laughs> okay. Taking up the whole airplane row. It, yeah. It's a medical condition because they likely have more retroversion. Right. Whereas females, it's very easy for them to bring their knees together because their thigh bones are already rotated inward. So they have more antiversion. And I believe actually, even though they don't mention this, you've heard about the increased ACL tears in, in female athletes. Gosh, yes. Oh. I believe this is why. No one is testing femoral antiversion and correlating it with the degree of ACL tears. We can go into that more deeply. But anyway, uh, so this is another thing. And most practitioners don't even know, A, well, they've heard the terms, but they don't even know how to test it. Right. And if they do, and if they do know how to test it, they don't know how it plays out in our system. Yeah. How it's both causing pain and how to use it to solve pain. The and so, so these are, <laughs> I'm sorry. The so what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's really what it comes down to is so what? So that's why when like, because I've trained all of my therapists in this approach to solving pain. And so their common description is that it's a more comprehensive way of looking at the body, but a much simpler way of, mm -hmm. of solving pain. It is so simple when you understand how the body works together to understand and solve pain. But this is a systems point of view, but we're not trained in a systems point of view in PT school. Strangely enough, you would think of all places, physical therapists would be trained in systems thinking, but we're not because our big focus is identifying which muscles, nerves, bones they are and blah, blah, blah. Not how it all works together. So anyway, that's what I would do is I would watch your gait pattern. I would test for more antiversion, retroversion. I would test to see if your hip tracking was correct, whether your muscles are turning on correctly, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And we'd fix whatever needed to be fixing there. Probably find a hot mess, but hey, I'm trying. <laughs> but that, that eval takes maybe 15 minutes. I wow. mean, it's really quick. Once you know what you're doing, okay. you can move through this very quickly and solve pain very quickly. Mm. How inspiring. The other thing you said, I meant to touch back on this, that I can see some people either rolling their eyes or getting really frustrated. But to me, I found it inspiring. You said, I am the source of my pain. You know, yeah. if, if that is true, then you can be the source of not being in pain. So I love Absolutely. a whole different yeah. way to look at it. You not being in pain can't happen without your involvement. Right because you're the only one who's using your body. Right. The opposite of that is something I'll, I hear amongst um, clients, patients. I have a bad back or my back is bad. You know, so yes. that's external. That's this thing that I cannot control. And, and maybe that is the opposite of empowerment, my bad back. Um, yeah. I'm can I, something. Can I explain something about, you've mentioned twice getting to the root cause. And, and I want to, and now you've brought up the bad back and the distancing my control over it. Right. And so I just want to address that for just a second. Right. So I was talk I was taking Dr. Saruman's courses and at the beginning of my first course with her, I made friends with a PT and we both over the next course of a year or two had gone through the courses and graduated at the last course together. And I said, Hey, how's this working for you? And he says, eh. I said, what are you talking about? This is like solving major pain in, in my patients. And he said, yeah, but I'm a manual therapist. So maybe I'll just use it for a home program. So folks listening, a manual therapist is someone who does soft tissue work or joint manipulations and believes that you should, they should be able to solve your pain for you by doing something to you, right? And so that's when I realized that our belief systems as medical practitioners 
are filtering out the information that are, will actually help our patients. Now, fortunately for me, for instance, his, his patients will never hear of movement as a solution or cause of their pain. His patients will only hear that you've got a rotated vertebra or something like that, and they'll manipulate it or do some soft tissue and try and solve it. So this is when, when I realized that our belief systems were filtering this out, that's when I wrote my initial series of Fixing You books, because I felt like I needed to do an end around practitioners to take this information directly to people, because this information didn't exist in, in the general public. It was only in textbooks that had to be deciphered. Even for me, it was hard to decipher everything and took a lot of experience for me to put it into pr practice. So that's why I created those first books. And so when you saw, talk about getting to the root cause of something, that practitioner felt that that rotated vertebra would be the root cause of their pain. I, as opposed to my thinking, is that your gait pattern and how you're bending and sitting and lying down and your exercise history and your injury history, those are the root causes of your pain. But that's often because we're not trained to understand that as a root cause or a component of people's pain. It's too big and, and, and unwieldy for most practitioners to be able to put together. Fortunately, I've had 20 years to put it together and, I, and I've simplified it. So it's not that, that hard, but I just wanted to speak about, because every, every patient has heard, oh, we're gonna get to your root cause of pain. I can't think of any practitioner who doesn't say that they're trying to solve your root cause of pain. The problem is what they believe is the root cause of pain. Bingo. I love it. So this is what's coming to mind <laughs> for me, what I'm hearing, your aura. <laughs> philosophical physical therapist <laughs> like you're, you're at thirty thousand feet yet you're able to simplify into a method which is so cool but i love this you know it's you're discussing cognitive bias really you know if i come into the situation saying you know how can i help my um, clients who have type 2 diabetes if my bias is that you're lazy wow, I'm just going to say you need to move more, but that doesn't address all of the other factors. So I love that. I relate to it very much. And it, that's a challenge to anyone working within the medical industry, listening to this, or even in a different industry to, to challenge yourself on, is it possible that I have a biased point of view just coming into this project? So thank yeah, you for well that. Wisdom. Fortunately, I was I was such a failure at being a PT. I had no alliance <laughs> to any any you know point of view. I just was going for things that worked. I need to find something that's going to help my patients, right. and that was really my that that was my decision tree. Did it help them? Did it not help them? If it helped them, then I'm on the right track. If it didn't help them, and knowing that pain can respond almost immediately to the right thing help me make those decisions even faster. So uh, that's what helped me come up with this whole thing is not a, a philosophy, but instead what is working. And that's how I was able to figure all this out. Right. I love it. That's a simple decision tree. And uh, yes, you keep saying failure, but probably most of us, hopefully most of us think this way. If not, it's time to start, but failure can be the best teacher. So in your case, I would say <laughs> it sure was. Failure, <laughs> anxiety, and a little OCD right. all worked in my favor. <laughs> we all of our, as I say, when I get um, accused by my husband of being slightly slash unbelievably OCD, as in your car keys do not belong on the counter, they belong on the hook that is designated for your keys only. There's a flip side of that right that that's the annoying side but then there's another side so yeah the focus on eliminating pain without medication or surgery so let's let's circle back to that because i admittedly have a bias against medication you know if they're needed fine but a lot i just see a lot of people relying on these band-aids and it, to their detriment in in many ways i'd like to talk to you about this idea of pain medications first all okay. right so the way medicine works is you've got back pain, let's say, 
you go to your doctor and your doctor says, I'm going to send you to a physical therapist. You go to that physical therapist and they don't help you. Well, let me send you to this other physical therapist. Okay, well, I heard about this chiropractor. How about this? How about this massage therapist? What about this acupuncturist, right? So when you fail all of these other practitioners, each time you're going back to your doctor and saying, didn't help, what's next, right? Well, the doctor only has so many avenues. They're not, they're not trained to solve your pain. They're trained to send you to the people who will solve your pain and identify who that should be, right? So I don't know of any doctor who is rubbing their hands, waiting to prescribe pain medications to people. I believe that they are only, this prescription is happening because we're failing on my end of things, the physical therapy, chiropractor, massage, whatever, because we're not understanding pain and solving it when we're supposed to be the experts. So if you're going to keep coming back to me with complaints of pain and you've run through all of my experts that should be able to solve your pain, then I'm only left with one other avenue or two, either surgery or pain meds. It's the natural conclusion of the way our system is set up. So that, that's really, I believe, the driver of the pain med issue is our failure as practitioners to solve pain. Uh, and that's, that's, where, that's where this whole approach to fixing things and getting it and understanding how all of these things, your injury history, how you're moving, how you're sitting, all that kind of stuff, plays into solving and becoming this more holistic. I don't like the term holistic so much because that means different things to different people. Okay. But really I'm solving how you use you. And that if that's holistic, then that's that's the approach. So I, I couldn't help myself when you were talking about the back and forth and try this guy and try that gal. It's like uh it's practitioner ping pong, just off you go. <laughs> it really is. And, and, and you know, the, the sad consequence of that is that the patient is made left to feel that they're broken. Yes. Right. Because each person has said, oh, I know exactly what this problem is. And then they try three treatments. Oh, well, it's going to take maybe 10 more. Okay. Well, we'll grow 10 more. Well, this is harder than I thought. This is going to take maybe 20 more treatments and then we'll, and then, so that they're, they're just led along because the patient doesn't know because again, we're not given the vocabulary to interpret what our bodies are trying to teach us. And so we're just going with the experts. And so, you know, that's, that's just the way it works. So when you fail five different practitioners and maybe even a surgeon who supposedly fixed something, you begin to believe that there is no help for you. Okay. But the problem is, is that, all of these people have in common is that they are component thinking. It's right. the training of identifying a tissue and trying to fix that tissue that is the problem at the expense of solving the reason the tissue is in pain or inflamed in the first place. That's a different question. Yeah. Well, and what you just mentioned is, you know, if you're playing provider ping pong and you're progressively getting more discouraged. Now that psychological element of the three yes. pillars of pain is, you know, firing more. So that's a great, um, you're absolutely right. Great explanation. So <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, um, do you have a, and I'm sure you have a thousand, but I, I do love, everyone loves a good inspiring story, right? Is there a particular patient that just comes to mind first where you're bringing them from pain to, to health or from pain to pain free. Do you, give us a story, a feel good story. Well, okay. This, my latest book is full of these stories awesome. solving the pain puzzle, but I'll tell you one that's not in the book. So, um, uh, I owned my own orthopedic clinic about, uh, until about a year and a half ago. And just before I left, uh, I had a patient come in who, uh, she walked to my table and more hobbled than anything. And you could just tell that she was in incredible pain. And so she sat down and she literally told me, just give me 60 seconds so I can recover just from walking to the waiting room, to the chair. And, you know, I was breathing through her pain. And so I started asking her questions. She was seeing me for plantar fasciitis. 
Mm. I, and I said, uh, wow, that plantar fasciitis must be really painful. And she says, oh, well, no, this is, this pain isn't, I mean, the reason I had to take a moment wasn't because of my plantar fasciitis. It's my back pain, but you can't help me with my back pain. No one's helping me with my back pain. And so I thought, you know, nothing gets my right. tackles up more than, than someone telling me I can't help them. So I said, well, tell me a little bit about your back pain. So she had developed back pain. She was a uh, collegiate swimmer at, on scholarship and developed back pain. No one could solve it. This was 15 years earlier. Uh, had gone through her program. She had lost her scholarship uh, because of it. And over the, the next 15 years, no practitioner had ever been able to help her back pain. And so she, so she just gave up on it and, and was here for her plantar fasciitis. Oh. Yeah, she, she didn't even come for her back pain. So she was in so much pain, though, I couldn't even conduct an exam because even just standing up from the chair, would, she would have to brace herself. You know, she was in that much pain. And so thankfully, I just saw what I thought was a major problem just watching her walk to my table. So I put two little pieces of tape on the backs of her knees. And I said, uh, you're gonna, I'm not going to let you lock your knees for the next three days. And so she came, comes for full, full circle for your knee pain, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. She came back and her back pain and plantar fasciitis were both 75% better in three days. Just from that one little correction. And this is the beauty of understanding things from a system standpoint, is that uh, when you fix one thing in a system and understand the the ramifications, it's like throwing a pebble in a pond and seeing the ripples go out to the shores and back again. And that's what I knew that that knee unlocking was going to do for her back and her plantar fasciitis. Wow, that is wonderful. And that then we could go on and fix the other things after that. Did she want to get back in the pool? We didn't even talk about that, but <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't encourage it because it was that whole pattern of the swim pattern is the thing that she had a problem with in the first place. If she really wanted to work towards that, I would have helped her with that, but that she just wanted to live pain free. That's, right. you know, forget swimming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that ultimately was what I needed to do is forget ballet, uh, which helped very much just not built. Yeah. So, um, in closing, um, one of the things I like to ask our guests, um, as I am all about the pleasures of the table, to me, this is something, you know, we talk about macros and real food and all kinds of, of things in the sort of food industry, the health and nutrition world, but we rarely talk about the pleasures of the table. And to me, this is this missing piece of the metabolic puzzle. You know, it should be pleasurable to eat um, on different levels. And, and you see this in, in full form anytime you, you visit Europe. It's just a completely different approach. So I'm curious if you, in your either daily or, or weekly life, do you have a table side tradition that you you enjoy? You know, I'll share with you mine, like each night my family and I just do a toast to the day and it's just part of this like all right we're going to sit here and enjoy each other's company we talk about something for which we're we're grateful what say you gosh you know we don't have a a, a hard and fast tradition however uh we're very committed to healthy eating so um i i guess our, our tradition would be to make sure that we're having a healthy meal I support my wife in that and she supports me. And so, because if it was left to one or just one of us, I would veer towards the unhealthy eating in a, in a, in a heartbeat, but she keeps me honest and I keep her honest. So that's our tradition is that we keep each other honest about our healthy lifestyle with, with eating. That's wonderful. That's a, a high value in my book, yes. <laughs> literally in my book. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your taking the time to, to talk to Nourishment Mindset listeners and viewers. I do want to let y'all know that if you don't choose to watch, you're going to miss out on Rick's skeleton. Does your skeleton have a name? 
Uh, I'm taking names, so uh, your listeners can uh, submit uh, names for my skeleton. That's awesome. I, the skeleton thing, um, I, I have to admit, uh, makes me smile because I grew up in a household with an orthopedic surgeon and he loaned us his skeleton every year for Halloween. So his name was Jojo and he sat in a window and was adorned with all sorts of, you know, a smoking pipe, a hat, all of this. Um, but it really, but in all seriousness, you know, it was really helpful to see on the video where he's pointing out, particularly the curvatures of, of the spine. I've never even thought of that. It's quite an artful design when you, when you really sit there and study it. So thank you again for your time. In closing, I just want to thank all of you for your support, listenership, viewership. I love your questions, show ideas. They inspire shows like this. So keep them coming. And if you haven't yet subscribed, just hop on over to favorfat.substack.com. Have a nourished couple of weeks, y'all. And uh, Sante to your health.